Welcome to World of Warcraft Deep Dive. Hello, BlizzCon! Thank you for coming to the WoW Deep Dive panel. My name is Paul Cubitt. Uh, today we're going to dig a little bit deeper into some of the systems that define what goes into World of Warcraft Shadowlands. A uh, quick outline what we're going to talk about. First, I'm going to talk about covenants, what they are and what they do. Next, we're going to talk about some of the changes that are coming to leveling. Uh, next up after that, classes, some of the changes for your classes. Uh, and the philosophies about uh, what we're thinking about uh, making those changes. And lastly, uh, I'm going to talk about Torghast and the maw that surrounds it. So without further ado, covenants. First, as you know, we are going to the Shadowlands. When you get there, you're going to quest through four different zones. Uh, in the context of those zones, you're going to learn about the four different covenants that rule over them. And then when you get to max level, level 60, you're going to get the opportunity to make a choice of one and only one of these covenants. Which one do you want to join? Let's review what uh, these covenants are and what they're all about. First up is the Kyrians. They're the denizens of Bastion. Their role in the Shadowlands is to shuttle souls from the world of the living to the world of the dead. They're all about purity and humility and righteousness, good stuff like that. Up next are the Necrolords. These guys, their role in the, in the uh, Shadowlands is to defend the plane against uh, outside invaders. They're uh, comprised of abominations, spies, warlords, uh, very much kind of a proto-scourge vibe. The Night Fae, these are the denizens of, uh, of uh, Ardenweald. Uh, their role in, the, in the, uh, the business of the Shadowlands is to shepherd the cycle of life and death. When a powerful wild god or powerful character of nature dies and passes into the Shadowlands, the Night Fae will um, help bring them back to health so that they can return to the land of the living again. And lastly, the Venthyr. These guys live in Revendreth. Sounds like we maybe have some Venthyr fans. Uh, they are the punishers of the unworthy. Uh, if you were evil in life, sinful or prideful and the like, you might get sent to Revendreth and the Venthyr will bring you low so that you can be built back up again as a functioning member of the Shadowlands. Uh, there's a lot of choices, that are, uh, factors that are involved in making this choice of which covenant you want to join. Uh, let's discuss which, uh, what those are. First up, your covenant sanctum. Uh, this is a place you're going to be spending a lot of time, not unlike your, uh, your faction hall that you had, or your uh, class hall that you had in Legion. Uh, so think to yourself, where do you want to spend time uh, in Shadowland? Do I want to be in a glittering city in the sky? Uh, with the, the Necrolords, do I want to be staying in this big, awesome-looking skeletal uh, statue of a warlord? Do I want to be in the glittering galaxy-surrounded uh, uh, veil in the middle of the forest? Or in a spooky vampire castle? <laughs> the choice is yours. Next big thing to consider, the abilities they're going to teach you. The first is a covenant ability, which everyone in the covenant learns, uh, independent of your class. This is a non-combat ability, typically, although you can use a lot of them in combat. Uh, this is, I like to say it's a way that you can solve a problem without fighting it. As an example, let's look at the Night Phase Covenant ability, Soul Shape. With this, you turn into a Spirit Fox. Uh, it gives you a short dash, uh, and also, during the duration, enemies ignore you. It lasts for 10 seconds, or as long as you want if you're in a rest area. So there's a couple applications here. You can use it to just you know, run forward pretty quickly. You can use it to skip a couple creatures you don't want to fight for one reason or another. Or you could just hang out as a fox. <laughs> one cool thing about this ability, which isn't reflected uh, in the tooltip, is that it's customizable. There's a number of different creatures. <laughs> a number of different creatures in Ardenweald that you can choose to, uh, to be. So maybe you're more of a Glimmerfly, more of a Rune Stag. There may even be some you know, rare uh, prestige appearances that you can unlock as part of your Covenant campaign. That is the, the Night Fae ability. Uh, Unburden is the Kyrian ability. It's playable on the show floor. This is a much faster dash. You get 300% faster. Lasts a little bit longer, but also you can kind of use it to like, float across canyons and things like that. It also will reduce uh, the, uh, the radius at which enemies detect you, so you can kind of sneak around things. The Necrolords get Transcend the Flesh. This is one of my favorite new abilities, where you pull your soul out from your body, leaving your body behind, and you can kind of walk around in the spirit world. And meanwhile, your body stays behind and keeps doing whatever you were doing before. If you were just in town, it'll just stand around. If you were fighting a creature, it'll kind of dumbly keep fighting it, maybe use one or two of your abilities. 
and you can do whatever you want. You can fall down a cliff and not take damage because you're a, you're a spirit, right? You can run behind a tree and then pull your body back to you and confuse whatever you were fighting before. Lots of creative applications. Lastly is Door of Shadows, the Venthyr ability. This is probably the most straightforward. You just pick a location, and then poof, within a couple seconds, you're there. Uh, very similar to Reaper Teleport in Overwatch, or Overwatch 2, if you're familiar with those games. Uh, you're also going to learn a class ability. This fits in the space, uh, in the intersection of what your covenant is all about and your class is all about. This is a way to solve problems by murdering them, a uh, classic World of Warcraft ability. Uh, it should feel kind of like your artifact active abilities uh, from a couple expansions past. As an example today, let's look at the Kyrian Mage ability, Radiant Spark. Okay, so this ability does arcane damage, independent of whatever your spec is. All mages will learn this if they join the Kyrian. Uh, it also deals damage over time. And during that window of eight seconds, your next four attacks will deal, the first one does 25% additional damage, and then 50%, and then 75%, and finally 100% additional damage letting you pull off some really cool combos uh, if you can manage to fit those abilities in in time. We're going to use Mage for our other examples as well. If a Mage joins the Necrolords, they'll get Contagion Bolt. has kind of a similar container to Radiant Spark, but it plays a lot differently. It deals shadow damage, which is correct for a Mage uh, in this case. And uh, in this case, your next damage, uh, damaging attacks will splash plague damage to nearby enemies. So if you want to have another AoE uh, button in your rotation, you might consider joining the Necrolords with your Mage. The Night Fae have a completely different one. This is shifting power, where they're all about kind of balancing energies within the forest, and you get to do this by kind of pulling energy out from the ground, channeled over three seconds. Every second you channel will grant you haste, so you can use it as a self-buff, uh, and it also damage uh, enemies nearby. And lastly, the Venthyr have Mirrors of Torment. So the Venthyr in their zone will use mirrors to kind of reflect the sun's light and punish their enemies. You can do this to punish your enemies by joining the Venthyr uh, and uh, We'll make three uh, mirrors kind of rotate around your target, and anytime they do anything, cast a spell, use an ability, they'll be rooted and take damage. Okay, stepping back a little bit, story time. Soul binds. Within the story of the, uh, the Shadowlands, any two characters can choose to bind their souls together. This could be the result of a powerful friendship, uh, a romantic relationship, or just very close brothers or sisters in arms. Uh, but when these two characters choose to go through this ritual, each one will get some power from the other one. When you join a covenant, you get to find your soul, the characters as well. Here's some you might bind to in the Venthyr covenant. On the left, you'll see Theotar, the Mad Duke. If I bind my soul to him, a passive ability I might learn is arrogance. Basically, I deal more crit to creatures who have a lower health percentage than me because, haha, I'm better than you. <laughs> Nadja, she's more of a, a fencer, or very good with the sword, and so she'll increase your parry rating if you bind with her. If you don't know how to parry, she'll teach you how to parry. Okay, the point here is that this is a way to unlock new power over time. After you get to maximum level, you'll continue to increase your character's power by increasing your relationship with these characters. You can also customize your relationship and the power that they give you with a new item type called conduits. Here's an early look at what the uh, UI might look like in-game. This is Theotar's ability. You can see up at the top there, that's arrogance. That's where I'd get that ability. I have a choice for another ability if I uh, don't like this one. Here in the middle, this is a conduit where I've chosen to put in a survivability uh, ability, uh, which will uh, give me DR damage reduction uh, at low health. Alternate, alternately, I could put in this ability, which improves my healing. So without getting into too much detail, the point here is to give you a system which allows you to choose the soul bind which best suits you, uh, you should be able to choose these for whatever reason you like. Maybe you like the way that Theotar's abilities feel. Maybe you think that Nadja is better because uh, you know, she has higher damage throughput. Maybe you just like the way that Theotar looks. You like that ripping eight pack that he's, uh, he's representing. Those are all valid reasons to be able to choose, and you should be able to do so. You can also switch soul binds fairly easily, uh, as easily as switching talents. Just pop a talent tome or whatever, and you can switch your soul binds uh, to counter a particular challenge. And of course, these are big characters that have rich inner lives, and you're going to learn a lot about them uh, as you adventure near, uh, with them in the Shadowlands. I would like to point out these are not necessarily bodyguards. The nature of the Soulbind is you get their power, even if they're far, far away. So you're not going to have them following you around all the time. OK, in addition, you're also going to get lots of cool stuff. There's uh, weapons and armor which really reflect the aesthetics of what your covenant is about, including backpack-style cloaks. I call them backpack-style. But really, it's like cloaks that aren't just a piece of cloth, right? And I'll show you some examples in a moment. Uh, there's a mount, which is upgradable. 
So this is one of the prime ways that you can show how far you've really pressed your relationship with your covenant. There's world benefits. Uh, in the case of Maldraxxus with the ne Necrolords, uh, you can build your own abomination. We've called it build a bomb internally, where you kind of put together a head and arms and weapons, and, and he, he will follow you around as a bodyguard in that zone uh, as a perk of being a Necrolord. Other covenants will get different perks. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that there's a full co a covenant campaign which kind of defines your end game story uh, depending on which covenant you've joined. Let's take a look at some of those armor sets. These are the four plate sets. Kyrians, Necrolords, Night Fae, and Revendreth. Some back attachments. There's a wing look uh, for the Kyrians. This is one of the sigils of one of their temples. And lastly, kind of a halo-y shield look. So, okay, there's a lot of factors that go in to make this choice, and it's, it's the one that uh, you should consider all these factors before you make it. I do want to point out that it is possible to change your covenant if you feel like you've made a mistake or you want to meet someone new, but it will take some time uh, to build up your relationship with your new allies. Before I leave, I want to try something out. I know you have limited information, but I'm going to kind of call out the names of each of the four covenants and want to get some data as to like, what you guys are vibing on. So first, I'm going to go with Kyrians. Kyrians, where are you at? Okay. Necrolords, let me hear you. Yeah. Me, Paul Cuban, I'm a Necrolord. Night Fae, where are you at? Yeah. And lastly, if you're a Venthyr, say blah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Up next, my close friend and colleague Kevin Martins is going to talk about the changes to leveling. There you go. Thank you, Paul. Hey, everybody. It's great to be here. Hope you're having a great time. So 15 years of World of Warcraft now, and it's, it's quite a privilege to be working on a game like this, announcing our eighth expansion. Azeroth and all the uh, worlds we've attached um, are, are such a huge, awesome canvas to tell stories on. But along the way, we have had some um, issues that we've wanted to solve. Some things have come up as we've put 120 uh, different levels in the game, uh, a bunch of things have happened, and we tuned them over the years, as you've seen. I want to talk about what comes next for that. So first and foremost, this is the main thing we hear from everybody, um, that leveling takes too long, and I'll, I'll dive into that. Um, we, we had some pretty serious fixes for that. Levels are supposed to be meaningful in role-playing games. Um, you know, that's like the core stat for most people is that, like that's your base level. What level are you is the first question you ask when someone's playing a role-playing game. Because of the 120 and the speed at which we level, or sometimes it's too slow, it's lost some of that meaning, and we want to capture that and get it back again. And then weaving in and out of um, seven or eight storylines as you level up can get confusing pretty fast as well. So we have made a major push for this in that patch leading into Battle for Azeroth. Um, Paul actually led this effort, the guy that was just up here, um, to rescale the world. And that allowed us to fix some of the problems we had at the time. There's so many areas and levels to go through that each of the zones had such narrow level bands that you would typically out-level the story of any given zone before you were um, uh, anywhere near finished the story, and then all of the quests would turn green or even gray, and the, the role-playing gamer in you would want to move on and keep making progress. So that largely fixed it, leading to this current live state. These are, are roughly the level bands, and it's roughly in order that the expansions came out with some options, like at 60 to 80, you can choose to go to Outland or Northrend and, and so forth. So we have some, some pretty huge overhauls of all of this. Um, this is supposed to be festival as well, and I think it still is. When you're, you're starting a fresh character and that whole big world's ahead of you and there's so many adventures out there, that does and can feel special, but when most of the community, like when you're starting an alt and your friends are all you know, way further along or no one wants to start with you because it takes too long, uh, it's understandable. Or as a new player, it really feels like the party has left you, right? Like you're at the end of the parade and all you can see is uh, a single plastic bag rolling by in the breeze sometimes. We'd love to fix that. Um, <laughs> I like that graphic. Uh, so not every level is rewarding. With 120 levels, uh, we have two problems, basically. So either we give you a reasonable leveling time, um, and you, uh, you run through the levels so quickly that you gain one like every 15 minutes, and then none of them really feels special. You know, it, you, you take for granted every level. It, it's not, it doesn't feel much like an RPG at that point. 
Um, or we try to do like a reasonable amount of time for each level so that each level has time to breathe, and if you got a power, you have some time to use it before you get another one. Um, in, in either case, that is not quite the compelling balance we're looking for. Uh, okay, so I probably don't need to explain this. If you've alted like basically at all in the last 10 years, your question as a horde player might be, who is my war chief? <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. We refer to this as the war chief shuffle. Um, and it, it's a, again, this is part of that privilege to be able to have characters that can live lives out over decades, like 25 years of the Warcraft IP, to bring them back in and out and have, have their lives have real meaning. Most games, most um, uh, properties don't have a chance to do that, so that's a real privilege. But we, we think we can do better at this part as well. Um, and then Pandaria is a great example of since Pandaria was the current uh, live expansion, you have not been able to play through that uh, level up story start to finish in a way that was relevant for your character. Um, at this point, um, and I checked the data on this, most of you who choose Pandaria to level in, in the 20 level band it has, will get through Jade Forest, which is a very big starter zone, and then half of the next zone before you've out leveled that band and you've already moved on. And I don't think that does justice to all of these uh, expansions we've released before. So um, from those problems come these goals. Um, streamlining leveling, uh, I'll get into how that works, but it's going to be a lot faster and I hope a lot better. Along the way, we'd like to capture those expansion level stories again and give you an opportunity to complete one of those. Um, and we want every level to feel special again. And Brian's also going to touch on this in his class section about some of the ways we'll specifically do that. Um, while we were doing this exercise, it also occurred to us that this would be a great time for us to modernize the introduction to World of Warcraft. Um, and we didn't want to lose any of the existing stories we have, so we are adding a brand new starter zone, which I will run through for you as well. But we're keeping all the existing ones, so you get to choose which ones you'd prefer to do. All right, so what's new? The new level range is 1 through 60. Thank you. Primarily, it's not about balance. This is about having the numbers match the fantasy and having good pacing for leveling. So the levels come at the right pace to match um, what's best for, for what's coming new with each level. Uh, and along that lines, every level should unlock access to new content, you know, new talents or powers or abilities or new places to go, something special every level. You probably want to know what significantly means, and it's, depending on your play style, 60 to 70% faster to level from one 250. Um, I'll show you a graphic on how this works exactly and explain the, the function, but essentially you can take any of the previous expansions, including Battle for Azeroth, and you can set your story to that state and you can level from 10 to 50 through an entire expansion story as opposed to weaving in and out. And then lastly, our new starting zone is an island called Exiles Reach, and I have a lot to show you there uh, in just a moment. For your current live characters, what this means is basically that um, you will scale to match the new range. Uh, simply put, level 120s will become 50, and any level between those numbers will have some simple formula to match it to its new appropriate level. Um, and you will level from 50 to 60 in the Shadowlands. I think Ian went over all this yesterday in, in his uh, panel as well, if you happen to see that. And once again, not about balance. This shouldn't feel any different. You should be able to do whatever you're doing now. Um, many of us probably have characters that we're using to solo old content or to collect mounts or transmogs or something. That should feel the same. Uh, this isn't like a, a number squish or anything like that. It's just about, again, having the level number match uh, the fantasy of playing the game and, and feel a little more like an RPG in that aspect again. So uh, one more glance at what it is right now on live, and when we're done this pretty big job, it's gonna play out like this. All starting zones, including our brand new one, are going to be scaled from one to 10. This means Death Knight and Demon Hunter as well, and I'll talk about allied races a little bit later. Um, you can then choose any expansions story to level through, including Battle for Azeroth, and you will level at that point. When you, leave, when you get around 50, you'll go to Shadowlands, you'll be quested naturally there and enter that storyline. So put yourself back in the shoes of someone who's never played before, and this will feel a lot different. You know, our, our plastic bag blowing by will not be there anymore. 
From character creation, uh, your only option as a brand new player for your first time through is Exile's Reach. Here's our first shot of the zone. So the story here is that your, your um, faction has learned of this previously uncharted island. They sent an expedition there a couple of weeks ago, and it has not reported back. So you, as a new recruit, are part of the second expeditionary force, a bigger, stronger force, to try to find out what happened to the first one. Uh, this zone has a lot of our, our favorite things about World of Warcraft, like the level designers and the artists did a really good job. It's got the big mountains with the waterfalls. It's got the deep, dark forests, uh, vistas. A lot of our favorite monsters are in here. We've got murlocs. We've got harpies. We've got quillbore. We've got ogres. Uh, in fact, uh, the story of the zone is essentially that there is an ogre who is trying to He's captured all of your forces, and many of the ones you bring with you as well, and he intends to sacrifice them in a big ritual to bring a dragon back from the dead. And the reason I mention that is one of my favorite parts of the island is that we are ending it in sort of a mini two-boss dungeon. So it does not have all of the trappings and limitations of, of a fully-fledged dungeon, like you don't have to have rolls. It'll scale to match the party that you have. So you can play it alone. You can play it with friends. There's some NPCs in there to help you out. You can queue or not queue as you prefer. So it's not meant to be a blocker. But it's supposed to introduce people to the concept of things to come, to show them the promise of um, some of our favorite features as longtime players. And it'll end on that you know, big hook. You get to kill an ogre and kill uh, a dragon. And that really captures the attention of your faction leaders. So from there, from being a new recruit, leveling up to 10 in here, you will be quested naturally into the capital cities. You get the lay of the land a little bit before then uh, moving right into Battle for Azeroth. So again, for the first time players only, they have to level up in Battle for Azeroth their first time. The reason we selected this is not just because it's our most recent expansion, but I think because shared history and shared stories help build community. And one of the things we hear from new players is they feel like they're, like they're left behind, like they're not part of the existing community. Coming into Shadowlands with these most recent events in mind, with everything that happened to our big cast of characters, coming with the same stories and that, the same events um, entering Shadowlands, I think that they're going to uh, feel a lot closer to where everyone else, where the rest of us are at when they get there. So for existing players, you can also choose to go to Exile's Reach if you want. And I think this has some benefits. You know it's new, so the first time will certainly be fresh. But also, if you play two different races in a, in a given faction, you don't have to spend that time walking across the world, having one of you to, to meet somewhere where you can level up together. You can start in Exile's Reach. That should be nice as well. Uh, or you can choose any of our existing starting zones, as you always have. You know, this is part of the, the legacy of the game. I think we all have a lot of memories here. And we didn't want to get rid of them just to add something new. We'd rather add the new thing as an option in this case. Thank you. So you also go to the capital cities, but this is where things get a little more different. Chromie reaches out. So she can see you've done this before, and she is going to um, help you choose one of these expansions. Um, you can think of this as analogous to outdoor time walking, essentially. So you will choose a setting, we'll aim you at the correct story, and you can do all of your leveling all the way up to 50 in which of these stories you want to. Those of you who still want to play War Chief Shuffle can go ahead and just wander around the world, right? You're not, you're not forced to do this, but we think that this is going to be a much better experience and, and give justice to these stories that have been lost in, in the terms of relevance over the years. Um, at or around level 50, um, you'll leave Chromie Time, um, that outdoor time walking mode, and you will enter Shadowlands with everyone else. So a little graphical summary of all of this before I pass it on to Brian. New players will start in Exile's Reach, they will, they will level their first character through Battle for Azeroth and then 10 to, or sorry, 50 to 60 in Shadowlands. Existing players, uh, similar flow, uh, including Death Knight and Demon Hunter, can choose any of the existing starting zones they want. Um, they will then choose which expansion they would like to level in from there. And uh, Chromie uh, will help you with that. And then you also enter into Shadowlands. And then for allied races, uh, simply put, they start at level 10, and they can pretty much go directly to uh, the Chromie choice, and then, again, 50 to 60 in Shadowlands. Okay, so uh, that is it for me. I want to pass it off to Brian Holinka to tell you about classes. Thank you. All right, hello, BlizzCon. How are you? 
I, I got to tell you, I've, I've really missed this. Um, for those of you who, who don't know, uh, I actually spent a little bit of time away from World of Warcraft working on another project, and it kind of made me sad. I, you know, I, I missed you all. I missed everyone on World of Warcraft, and I, you know, I felt like I had, I'd lost something. You ever feel like you lost something? You know, like, you know? I mean, a lot of you look like you lost weight. You look good, I got to tell you. But I mean, like, something y'all had, something that really was core to your being, and then it was taken away, and you didn't know why, and you felt bad about it. Well, you know, those stories, they always have a happy ending, and we'll get to that. But I want to talk a little bit about the beginning of that story. Um, has anyone here played a World of Warcraft classic? Anyone? That's good. Well, you tell your friends about it. Uh, World of Warcraft Classic, it's a great leveling experience, right? You start off clean slate at level one. You, every level you earn, you're a little bit stronger. Uh, you start earning abilities and different spell ranks every other level. You get talent points past 10. You build out this tree. It's a great experience. Character gets more powerful. We love it. And that worked out really well to expand on that system through Burning Crusade, Wrath of the Lich King, Cataclysm. And then Mist of Pandaria, we were starting to see some issues. You know, we were getting feedback that my action bars are full, please, please. Spell books were confusing, and also we were power creeping a lot of gameplay to dangerous places. So we did our best to change that. We took a look at the talent system, and we said, hey, this is something we want every choice to be interesting and compelling. And, and, and then in Warlords, with I swear to you, the very best of intentions, we started to surgically remove some abilities that we thought would not be too problematic. And then came Legion and the artifact system. Anybody like the artifact system here? Yeah. So the artifact system was great because it was these awesome iconic weapons that every spec got to use, 36 different weapons that a spec got to use. And as a part of that, we wanted to deliver like every spec being super cool, super distinct, and playing to the, the, the fantasy of these weapons. So we started doing some things. We said, okay, this spec is going to be about poisons, this spec is going to be about pirates, and this spec is going to be about the shadows and, and the stealth. And, you know, to some degree, we kind of got lost a little bit on what being a class meant and what being a spec meant. We really pushed things away, and we actually pushed a lot of the specs further away from being a member of their class than we ever had before. So moving forward, in Shadowlands, we have these covenants. And the covenants, they're about being a part of these, you know, these four uh, groups that are fighting in this, this plane of death, in the Shadowlands. And we want to give you cool class abilities. We want to give you those racials. And the soulbind system that Paul talked about is going to tap into things. But through the artifact system and Azerite traits, we learned we, we just don't have enough hooks. Like, we want to give you cool, compelling rewards for our progression system. But, like, we're putting heal on blank and stuff like that. So we're in a dangerous spot. Uh, so what we want to do is kind of recalibrate everything with, the, the, with this opportunity we're doing to improve the leveling experience. We have an opportunity to really listen to everything you've been saying through Legion, through Battle of Azeroth, and take action on a lot of your feedback. And always the most common piece of uh, feedback is, hey, just fix it, right? Fix the problems. Which I'll be honest, fix it is a great piece of feedback because you're just saying, I'm not happy. You know, I want something better. Or, you know, not everyone can really uh, say what exactly it is that's bothering them. But, you know, there's just this idea, I want something fixed. But we, you know, have to gauge how disruptive we want to be. Because when you're going in the Shadowlands and you just, you know, you just loaded up on launch day and you're going with your friends, we want you going into the Shadowlands. We don't want you to be like, I don't remember how to ride this bicycle. We want you to get in there and get in the game right away. So... We want to fix problems, but we really want to make sure that the things we're doing are worth the disruption to the players, because someone is playing that spec and is probably pretty happy right now. So we only want to hit home runs as much as we possible, and we want to say, is this more fun for the player, or are we doing it just to fix kind of a, a problem that bothers us as designers? So I don't think you'll see as extensive class changes as we say saw in Legion, but we're going to be mostly additive. 
because as Kevin mentioned, we want to make sure that every level is rewarding. So you're going to get a new spell, but from level from 1 to 60, you're going to get a new spell or a piece of content, a dungeon, maybe you get access to your mount, or one of your spells is going to get bigger and stronger. And part of that, that's a lot of abilities that we get, got to give you, and part of that is this idea of returning to class from spec. So let's say you're going to make a priest in Battle for Azeroth. So you make a level one priest. Well, actually, you make a level one disciplined priest. And then you play from one to 10, and you're that disciplined priest, and you hit 10, and you're like, well, now I want to be shadow. So you select shadow, and like, half your buttons fly away, half, all these new buttons appear, a lot of things change. And it's not even like you change specs, and you got additional things. It's actually like you just change classes completely. So in Shadowlands, when you start at level one, you're going to be an unspecced priest. You're going to learn all these different abilities about all your different specs. And then when you pick a spec at 10, new things are going to come to you, and you're going to become a shadow priest or a disciplined priest or whatnot. And a part of that is because, you know, all of the, I think what's pretty foundational is that classes are made up of elements of each and different spec, and then a spec doubles down on it. You know, all paladins can embrace the light to help their friends. All paladins protect their allies, and all paladins, ex, you know, execute their enemies with divine judgment. Each of, when you pick a spec, you really do that in a particular way. So one of the things we want to do is make sure we can do this and give you a lot of abilities. And so this is where the story of loss turns to the tide. Let's talk about some of the abilities that are coming back and why. So the first category of them are class-defining mechanics. These are spells that have a kind of unique hook. They kind of share a unique hook. And they help deliver class fantasy in a particular way. Like, does anybody know a paladin here, right? Paladins, they've, they've got a certain air about them, right? I'm not, you know. And the way that was kind of expressed through the game was through auras. Whenever you looked at your tooltip, whenever you used to look at your buff bar and you saw that little shield, you knew that a paladin was with you. And that was important. That's the thing that they, you know, when you're just in an RPG and you're playing with a pal and he's always telling you how great the light is and stuff, that's just kind of a way he expresses it. Uh, another idea is the idea of totems. Now, there, shamans still have some totems. Maybe they'll throw down capacitor totems to stun a bunch of enemies. Maybe they'll throw tremor, tremor totem. It's, it's nice that we have these kind of occasional totems going down, but it's kind of always been a fact that to totems were there all the time. So just giving back some persistent totems, like healing stream totems to the whole class, or searing totem, just to give a little additional presence that everybody will see these totems laying around there and know there's a shaman in their group. Are there any rogues here? <laughs> Not anymore. You failed the first test of being a rogue. <laughs> just shouting out, I'm here, you know. Uh, so. <laughs> so, so rogues, um, when we were making assassination rogues in Legion, we said, they're going to be the poison spec. And so we just put all the poisons towards them. Well, no more. Um, poisons are going to be a rogue class-wide thing. Because, you know, rogues are the only class that puts poisons on their weapons uh, and, and is really sneaky in that way, really sneaky. And uh, that, we think that's an important part of being their class. And the last one is uh, warlocks and, and curses. So it used to be the case that every warlock could put one curse on one target, and they had to make an important choice there. Do I put Curse of Doom on there, and then later it's going to explode, and a Doom Guard will appear, and I'll be able to enslave it and have them uh, join me? Or do I put Curse of Recklessness on there to make sure that these guys don't run away? And we thought that was a fun and cool choice, and we want to bring it back. Now, as I was mentioning before about uh, classes leveling up. Part of that uh, is starting from 1 to 10, it's starting unspec. Part of that is getting a little taste of every part of your class. And for some classes, they have different roles. And let's say Mage, for example, they're a damage dealing spec. So we feel like it's important that you tap into the different schools that you have as a mage. Um, and then you specialize in a particular one. So let's say you start off learning fi uh, Frostbolt, Fire Blast, Arcane Explosion, these are all different ways of dealing damage, and they're all done through different schools. 
And, but it still gives you that sense of like, I am a mage, I'm a master of these elements, uh, these arcane elements, fire and frost. And, uh, but still, you know, it's, it, when you pick a frost, you're mostly using frost spells for your rotation. Um, another idea is uh, how those spell schools lean into a particular role. So let's give an example of priests. Um, all priests can tap into the light to heal their friends, and they can harness the shadow to destroy their enemies. Now, a lot of you probably tap into the light to leap of faith your friends and destroy your allies. <laughs> and you'll still be able to do that because it's beautiful. Um, <laughs> but the idea that a holy priest could sh cast shadow word death to, to kill and finish off a mob, or a shadow priest rather than using shadow men is using flash shield, it just kind of leans into that class fantasy of what am I doing now, what's my role, and the spell school supports that. And then kind of a minor point, is the idea of the weapons that you get at, uh, as part of your class. Let's say you're a shaman, you start with a mace and a shield, um, but if you're an elemental shaman, you never get the experience of smacking anybody with that mace, and we think that's pretty important. So like at level one to 10, you'll get primal strike, and you'll be going around hitting people with maces, or if you're a warrior, and you have your shield, and you're, you get a little taste of what it's like to be with pr protection with shield block, and those are things that are gonna go with you for a long time. Now, another category is just these iconic class abilities. So you made it clear they're, they're just some abilities that they hold a special place in your heart, and you want to see them back. And like, these are like spells that they're either their original incarnation were class-wide, or um, for whatever reason, you've just always had them, and we've taken them away. So here are just an example of a couple spells that are coming back class-wide. Last, last, uh, not, I'm sorry, the second last, another category of spells is a, a lot of abilities that went and became talents or honor talents. You know, we have this really cool system with talents, but it really relies on having compelling choices to make. And so for us, we thought, well, we're trying to clean up action bars. We want talents about interesting choices. Let's take some of these uh, core abilities and we'll put them in the talent tree and then it'll be great. And it was great, right? Okay, so it wasn't so great. So it wasn't so great, and for a lot of the feedback was uh, that, hey, this doesn't even feel like a choice in this row. This is something that is so core and iconic to me. I want it all the time, um, so please give it to me. So, so these are some more examples of things that were talents uh, that will be coming back. And the last category is just like me and you guys, long lost friends, uh, back together. These are abilities that are coming back and you know, they were, they've been gone for a while and they went away for different reasons. Maybe we couldn't find a lot of application for them. Maybe we felt like they stomped on the niche of another spec. Um, maybe they were used to kill your friends in ritualistic ways. Um, <laughs> Or maybe we just didn't appreciate how much you love mind controlling your pet and exploring the world. So this is a, just a taste of things uh, that are coming back. Uh, I'm sure you know, we'll hear from you and we'd love to hear from you on the forums, on Twitter, in person, here at BlizzCon about anything I didn't list here. Um, and all of these spells, the, the best part about World of Warcraft is taking these tools and using them in combat. In, in classes, we like to say that we, we bring the hammer and nails and content, they bring the problems. So uh, up next, to talk about the newest kind of problem you're gonna deal with, new content uh, for Shadowlands. Paul, is Paul coming back on the stage? So thanks, everybody. You guys, I'm super excited to talk about this next feature. We're gonna talk about Torghast, the new dungeon experience, which is coming to World of Warcraft, and the Maw, the zone that surrounds it. So first, let's get the setting. What is the Maw? It's a zone. That means it's a place you're going to go. You're going to see other people there. It's a shared space. It is our access point to Torghast. If you want to get into Torghast, you have to go into the Maw first. Uh, it's the home of the Jailer, this mysterious character about which not much is known other than he's probably bad. And historically, the, the Maw has been a prison for the vilest souls in the cosmos. So you might remember earlier when I was out, I said that if you were evil and sinful, you got sent to Revendreth. That may have been a little bit misleading. That's where you get sent if you're bad but capable of being redeemed. The Maw is where you're sent if there's no hope for redemption for you. We just throw you in this place that is inescapable forever, throw away the key. 
The reason I say historically is because that's been the case up until a point a few years ago where something broke in the machi machinery of death within the Shadowlands. In the past, souls used to go to the Arbiter to be judged. You're a good soul, you go here. You're a medium soul, you go here. Bad to the Maw. Now all souls are going directly into the Maw. And that includes all the casualties of the Fourth War, all the casualties of Teldrassil. Now you as a player have a special role. You learn this pretty early. You are a Maw Walker. This means you have the ability to, uh, to transcend uh, the grip of death. You can enter and leave the Maw at will, which is something that nobody has ever been able to do before. And this is one of the reasons that those Covenants are so interested in getting you to join them, other than you just being a really good uh, hero, is because you can complete missions that they can't do, right? You can go in and save souls that have been unjustly imprisoned. You can save your friends that are in there. Maybe even ultimately, should it come to it, you can take the fight to the Jailer himself. So I thought that the best way to share with you guys how the Maw uh, plays and feels would be to do so in the context of a story. So I'm going to tell you a story about two brave, strong heroes, Paul and Brian. <laughs> you can see from our portrait frames up there, I am a Necrolord and he's a Night Fae, a lesson there. Uh, you can play together with people in other covenants, it's not an exclusive choice. So we are going to the Maw. Our plan today, by the way, in the story is we're going to go climb Torghast together. Uh, Brian is there, he's waiting for me at Torghast, I'm gonna go join him, but first I need to go into the Maw, which is this end game outdoor zone. It's a terrifying place. It's not just a place where we take the same types of creatures you see in Ardenweald or Revendreth and just plant, you know, paint them with a death ear coat of paint. No, it's actually significantly more dangerous there, and that's not, not just the creatures, but the environments and the mechanics of the space itself. You're welcome. So I enter the Maw. I'm making my way over to Torghast to meet Brian, and I run into this guy. Uh, I'll admit, I'm actually a pretty good player of World of Warcraft personally, so I figure I can take this guy on. It shouldn't be a problem. It was a problem. He kills me. <laughs> uh, and that's fine. This has happened before. As I release, I see something, and this is the Jailer has noticed you. What this is is a mechanic called the Eyes of the Jailer. Anything you do in the Maw, whether it be killing one of his elite lieutenants, dying to one in this case, saving souls, completing objectives, they will all incur the ire of the Jailer, and he will send increasing punishments at you. The first might be that the Shade Hounds, which you see around the area, might start to notice you from farther away. Their aggro radius is increased. So the more and more I do, the more of these guys will start adding on to my fights. Later, the Jailer might say, go kill that guy, he'll send kill squads directly to go kill Paul, he's the one who's causing all this trouble here in the Maw. And it will become more and more and more deadly. The lesson is, be surgical, be careful, know what you want to do, get in and get out, and try not to die too often. Luckily, today that's not too much of a problem. I'm going to just pass through the Maw to get into Torghast, where I meet Brian. It would have been nice if you uh, helped me kill that elite, I might say to him. Uh, but we are here now, Torghast. This is the center of the Maw. This is where the Jailer himself is, as well as his, his most uh, elite lieutenants, his most prized uh, possessions, his prized prisoners. It's also a strange place, a confusing place a place unlike we've never seen before in World of Warcraft. And so we are going to climb it. Here's a shot of the interior of Torghast. I love this shot because every time I see it, I think this is a cool painting. This is actually an in-game shot of what it looks like inside uh, of Torghast. Our artists have done an awesome job. And now we are inside the tower. We're now in an instance. It's a scalable dungeon from one to five players. That means you can go in solo, you can go in with a group of five players, you bring a tank and a healer, or maybe just five DPS, and it should always just work out. <laughs> that wasn't a joke, it actually does. It works. As you climb the tower, uh, your enemies will get significantly stronger. Terrifyingly so, it's actually like, like a lot stronger. Uh, but you're gonna grow in power too, with temporary powers per run that you get as you climb the tower. Of course, as you climb as well, the tower is going to increase in complexity. The first couple floors might be your standard dungeon crawl where you kill creatures, explore hallways, try to find the stairs to the next level. Higher up, you'll be dealing with traps, puzzles, uh, locked doors, more dangerous minions of the Jailer, and so on. Uh, there we are again. So, this is not our first time here in the tower. I distinctly remember last time when Brian and I came, there was this hallway which curved off to the left, and there was this caster defending it. This time, there's a hallway curving to the right, and there's this melee guy in the way. Okay, this is maybe a simplified example of the fact that the tower is always changing. The layouts are variable. They're built for exploration. 
you're not going to know where you're going anytime you enter Torghast. You need to explore and find the way. And because of this, by and large, this is not a timed mode. This is not Mythic Plus, right? It's a, it's a different thing. Uh, the goal here is to be thorough. Always be exploring. Try to get as much power as you can before you ascend to that next floor where the enemies are going to be that much more deadly. And that power comes in the form of something called anima. So anima is this magical soul stuff that pervades the Shadowlands. And when it manifests in the Maw, it does so in this uh, sticky, gross, stringy, black stuff that has incredible potential power. Power like you can see here. I can make a choice when I get some anima. There's a fairly straightforward choice. Do I want some additional maximum health or some additional mastery? Uh, I'm a DPS player, so usually I'll take that choice on the right. But I'll tell you, if I take this choice every single time in one particular run, I'm going to die pretty quickly because it's going to get really deadly. I need to make sure I'm shoring up my survivability as well. Here's a more interesting choice we might find, the corruption antenna. Your attacks have a chance to deal additional shadow damage over time to your targets. OK, so it's a way of me doing more damage uh, in a shadowy way. Why is that interesting? Because later, I might find another power like this, the shadowed iris. Dealing shadow damage has a chance to blind the target, severely re reducing their chance to hit me for a time. OK, so now I'm beginning to build a build here, right? Even if I'm not someone who normally does shadow damage, my attacks might trigger shadow damage, which then, then triggers the shadowed iris. And you know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, we have synergy. In our adventure today, this is the epic power that I find, uh, the golden idol. This is a power that actually doesn't give me any direct uh, player power at all, but it gives me information. I can see which enemies are holding additional anima. And this is, is especially good in groups, because only one of us has to have it, as long as we're talking with one another. I can see, like, oh, that hallway, we don't want to go down there. It's dangerous, and they're not carrying anything. Over there, that unassuming guy, he's got something. Let's go kill him. It works out great for our run. Brian takes a different tactic. Uh, he takes Ardent Endurance, which in, uh, increases the duration of his soul shape by 50%. So he's going to be running around much more often as, a, uh, as his rune stag form. He finds bloating fodder. So there's this creature that lives in Torghast. It's called a, a maw rat. They're this kind of uh, an irritating critter-like creature that, you know, pretty easy, but they get harder the higher you climb to. This makes it so that whenever a maw rat dies, they explode for 10,000 damage to everything nearby. And Brian manages to find eight stacks of bloating fodder. So now they're exploding for 80,000 damage every time they die. Lastly, to complete his trifecta, he finds the heavy hoof sandals, which makes it so that while you're under the effects of soul shape, maw rats instantly die. So we come up with a strategy where, OK, we find a little mini boss over here, leave him, kill everything else. There's a bunch of rats. OK, we'll kite them over, soul shape, explode them all. It goes from 100% to 0% instantly. It works great. Look how proud Brian looks of his discovery. <laughs> Up until we get to a point where there's, uh, there's no maw rats, and his build stinks, and we die. <laughs> so yes, Torghast is always changing. And it, that's true. It changes from run to run. Additionally, it changes over time. So as you press farther and farther into the Maw, the Jailer will change his tactics against you. After a couple weeks of the expansion, there will be an event called the Beasts of Prodigum, in which the, the Jailer floods the Maw and Torghast with bestial creatures like Shade Hounds and Soul Eaters and the like. Uh, this changes the creatures that you're going to be fighting. It changes the fighting experience in Torghast. It also changes the powers that are available to you. Like you might find the Chain of Command, which summons a Shade Hound that stuns and taunts, or maybe a different one. Uh, an item which summons uh, a soul leader that uh, inflicts area, area of effect damage and silences. And then after you get these, you might find other powers which make them hit harder or survive longer or make it so that you run faster when you're near them. This completely changes the pool of abilities that are available to you, changes builds that are available, and is one of the things that will keep the system really fresh and should be really fun. It's probably the mo thing I'm most looking forward to. Of course, having fun is only half of it. The other half is, what do I get out of it? And the answer uh, shortly is legendaries. So when you climb, when you climb Torghast, uh, you will find runes. You take these runes and bring them to a mysterious rune forge, which is uh, run by an even more mysterious rune sage. And this character will help you build legendaries. Uh, and in doing so, maybe learn a little bit more about the backstory of Frostmourne and the Helm of Domination. Uh, but most importantly, when you're making these uh, legendaries, it'll be with a great amount of determinism. You can choose what slot you're making them for, what powers go on them, maybe even what uh, secondary stat distributions you have on them. This should be a really fun system to engage with. And of course, once you have that legendary, your next run into Torghast, you'll probably make it even farther. That is all the time we have for uh, the panel today. So I, on behalf of the WoW team, thank you. I hope you're looking forward to Shadowlands. Have a wonderful BlizzCon.
Thank you for attending.